And uh, Esther, I guess if you just let me know when you want me to move on the slides, yeah? Okay, cool. All right, so um, good evening, everyone. My name is Esther, and I'm going to be talking about the importance of diversity and inclusion in innovation. Um, next slide. So I'm a junior software engineer at Compare the Market, and I work within the Android team. Um, I also have a side business called ABA Media, where I just do freelance content creation. Um, it's lovely to see everyone here today, and I hope you enjoy this presentation. I will just start by talking a bit about my experience with diversity and inclusion. So I went to the University of Warwick and I studied Morse, and that meant I was only one of two black females studying my degree, which was like a huge jump from my GCSE and A-level experience. So it left me often feeling somewhat uncomfortable in this new environment. But studying this for three years, inevitably, I broke through my insecurities and was able to create relationships with both people within my degree and outside of it, which kind of made me realize that though there was a lack of diversity, the environment was a lot more inclusive than I had previously realized. And even when working in smaller groups, I felt like my contributions were heard. And I think this is probably one of the first times I'd really understood the difference between diversity and inclusion. Um, and I might may as well start by explaining that difference. So what is the meaning of diversity? Sorry, next slide. Um, so simply put, the meaning of diversity is when a group of people have varying attributes. Um, there are two well-known types of diversity, inherent diversity and acquired diversity. Um, inherent diversity involves traits that you're born with, like age, race, or biological sex, um, whereas acquired diversity involves traits you gain from experience, such as cultural fluency, maybe gained from working in other countries or military experience, etc. And these are often much less obvious than um, when compared to inherent diversity, because you don't often see someone you've never met and say to yourself, oh, I bet they can speak about three or four languages, but you could think she's probably in her mid-20s. Next slide. So a lack of diversity, however, creates a homogenous um, environment where individuals tend to have a similar way of thinking, meaning that they are less likely to challenge the way that things are done. Um, research shows that leaders in these kind of environments are less likely to endorse ideas that they don't personally see a need for, even if it has market potential. Um, and this contributes to a hostile working environment and high turnover rates. And we all know that's a, a problem. Um, so what is inclusion? Next slide. So inclusion is when we embrace all people regardless of their diverse attributes, because every individual has the right to be respected and appreciated as valued members of their community. Um, this kind of culture brings about the best in people by allowing them to feel comfortable and confident in themselves and what they do. And it's very important to recognize that diversity is not the same as inclusion. So while diversity, um, diversity refers to human differences, inclusion refers to like a culture and environment where you feel like you belong. So if anything, an inclusive environment is what helps to sustain a diverse workforce rather than the other way around. And Diversity without inclusion can often be perceived as tokenism and can have adverse effects on a business. Next slide. So we'll now look at how and why diversity and inclusion are some of the main drivers of innovation. So um, next slide. An inherently diverse workforce can be a major source of innovation. Um, this is because diverse individuals are better attuned to the, meet, the unmet needs of consumers or clients like themselves. And this insight is critical when it comes to identifying and addressing new market opportunities. Next slide. Um, a diverse team also contributes to better decision making. Um, a well-known scen scenario is H&M's 2018 um, coolest monkey in the jungle crisis. So this black five-year-old boy modeled a hoodie and it said coolest monkey in the jungle written across it. And um, the word monkey is considered a racial slur used to degrade and dehumanize black people dating back to the 16th century. So inevitably, um, this ad sparked public outrage, which had huge negative implications on both H&M's &M, H finances and their brand reputation. Only after this happened, did H&M hire a global head of diversity and inclusion who put initiatives in place to ensure things like this wouldn't happen again. Um, and it's not surprising to learn that H&M's board of directors were all white. Uh, next slide. So creating and maintaining a welcoming and inclusive culture for all, all types of people um, makes talented individuals want to join and stay in a company. So firstly, 
This allows the company to tap into wider networks that they may have never otherwise encountered. But above this, people who are different from each other bring unique information and experiences to the table. And this diversity of information creates a positive tension within a group and that tension increases creativity. Um, this is because interacting with people that are different from you forces each member of the group to reassess their own assumptions, um, question things to understand others, and just prepare better for like discussions in general, therefore making it more likely for out of the box ideas to emerge. However, these market worthy ideas aren't really innovation until they're developed and deployed into the marketplace. So to get into the marketplace, they require the buy-in and endorsement of decision makers at every level. Next slide. So this is where acquired diversity plays such a vital role in transforming ideas into innovation. So leaders who have acquired diversity, so whose background and experience has enabled their appreciation for difference, be it gender, age, culture, or any other diverse attribute, these leaders are significantly more likely to behave inclusively than leaders who lack acquired diversity. Um, employees at inclusive companies with 2D diversity, so both inherent and acquired, um, are more likely than employees at non-diverse companies to take risks, challenge the status quo, and embrace a diverse spectrum of inputs. They are also 75% more likely to see their ideas move through the pipeline and make it into the marketplace. The Harvard Business Review revealed that without diver diverse leadership, women are 20% less likely than straight white men to win endorsement for their ideas. People of color are 24% less likely, and those who identify as LGBTQ are 21% less likely. So in other words, companies that harness both inherent and acquired diversity are measurably more innovative than companies that fail to harness these drivers. Next slide. So a benefit of this is that uh, a diverse workforce are better at, at anticipating and preparing for industry disruption. Um, companies who lack this insight often fail to innovate accordingly and then they tend to fall behind their competitors. A good example of this is Blockbuster. Um, they filed for bankruptcy in 2010 and this brand went from iconic to irrelevant within four years of Netflix launching their streaming services. But prior to this, the CEO of Blockbuster had refused to buy Netflix as he thought it was a small niche business and he practically laughed at the proposal. So although Blockbuster, their business model had been successful for many, many years, it was poorly suited to let in new information and embrace change, which kind of speaks volumes to the level of acquired diversity of its leadership. Um, next slide. So the connection between um, diversity and innovation has been proven by a, a substantial body of research. So here are some statistics regarding um, the link between um, diversity and innovation. Um, next, the first one is um, more diverse companies are 45% more likely to report annual market share growth and 70% more likely to enter a new market than less diverse companies. Um, the next point is that they are also six times more innovative and agile, eight times as likely to achieve better business results and twice as likely to meet or exceed financial targets. And the next point is that um, McKinsey analyzed the composition of executive teams in more than a thousand firms across 12 countries, and they found that more ethnically and culturally diverse companies were 33% more likely to outperform less ethnically and culturally diverse companies, and more gender diverse companies were 21% more profitable than less gender diverse companies. Um, next slide. So the connection, um, sorry, sorry, companies um, with at least one woman, woman board member had higher average return on investments and better average growth than firms with male only boards. Um, teams with at least one member who represented the gender, ethnicity, culture, generation, or sexual orientation of the team's um, target end user are up to 158% more likely to understand that target, increasing their likelihood of innovating effectively for that end user. Also, BCG surveyed 1,700 companies and found that companies with above average diversity produced 17% more revenue from innovation than companies but with below average diversity, which translated into overall better financial performance. 
So the evidence supporting the benefits of diversity to innovation and business growth is overwhelming. So you would think that most companies would be striving for this. However, only 5% of Fortune 1000 companies are run by women, even though those companies contribute to 7% of the total revenue of the Fortune 1000 list. Quantum also reported that 75% of employees in underrepresented groups don't feel like they personally have benefited from their company's diversity programs. So on that note, there's still a long way to go to cultivate truly diverse and inclusive environments. So how can we help? Here are a few ways we can promote a diverse and inclusive workforce. Next slide. So you can encourage contributions and ideas, be open-minded, seek the perspective of others. Um, you can actively seek opportunities to work with and get to know people that are different to you. Um, it's good to welcome ideas at all levels, not just experts, because anyone can be a catalyst for innovation. Um, you shouldn't shy away from presenting your opinions and insights. It's very important that you do. Um, share responsibility and decision-making authority with others. Share success and give credit where credit is due. Give and take on constructive feedback where you can enforce fair employment practices. Also, always try to identify and remove unconscious bias, um, ensure equal pay, uh, provide or complete diversity and inclusion training programs, and finally, set strong non-discrimination policies in the workplace. Implementing things like this consistently is important as brilliant individuals and high-performing teams can't deliver in a culture where channels for experimentation don't exist or failure is penalized. And the loudest voice in the room is that of the leader. So now Dawi is gonna just take over um, and kind of talk about what we're doing at CTM. Go for it. Thanks Esther. So uh, yes, as uh, Esther just said, so I'm actually going to be focusing more on uh, what Compare the Market is actually doing. Um, and kind of hopefully tying into uh, some of the themes there that, that Esther talked about. So one thing I'd, I'd start off with is that uh, uh, maybe not everyone uh, in this event today actually knows what Compare the Market do and who they are. So I thought I'd start there. Um, the meerkats are probably the, the most famous thing that everyone knows us for. And that's like a big part of our brand. And one of the reasons why I think we're, we're so successful, what do we actually do, we provide price comparison uh, across a range of things It used to just be insurance, but now we, we do things like uh, energy comparison, uh, broadband comparison, mobile comparison. And uh, we're located uh, across three places in the world. So we've got a an office in London, uh, which is obviously a very multicultural uh, city. We've got an office in Peterborough, which is less so. And then we've got an, uh, a, a sister office that we work with, uh, an, another organization called Godel that are based in uh, Belarus, in, in, uh, uh, in Minsk specifically. So as you can imagine, uh, having those offices in, in multiple locations. You've got lots of different people from lots of different backgrounds, very diverse. Um, and that's why uh, for me as well, it's really important that we have this focus in the business on diversity and inclusivity. And um, one of the things I kind of wanted to just touch on in terms of what we do as well, uh, we've obviously got tech teams, which are the teams that uh, Esther and I are part of. Uh, I'm part of data engineering and Esther works uh, in our Android mobile team, but we've got other teams as well that range from teams that deal with the front end website, uh, teams that do our kind of infrastructure work. We've also got marketing teams, we've got uh, product teams, everything you'd expect in a, in a normal organization. And um, I just kind of wanted to touch on before I moved on to the next slide in terms of how the pandemic affected us and, and uh, with us having to transition to working from home. Actually, before the pandemic, we were a pretty uh, good organization with allowing people to work from home. We were pretty set up for it. So the transition wasn't actually that difficult. Um, but obviously, from uh, a business perspective, it, it did affect us. From a personal perspective, it affected everyone as well. And again, that's another challenge, I think, especially from a mental health perspective, that uh, comes to the fore when you think about diversity and inclusivity and how to, to work with that in, in a business. 
So uh, one of the, the first things I wanted to talk about is Code Bar, and, and some of you may be familiar with Code Bar. It's an organization that started in London. It's a not-for-profit organization, and um, they effectively focus on setting up what they call Code Bars. Uh, Previous to the pandemic, this would be in uh, different offices of different businesses in London initially, and now actually they've started uh, building what they call chapters across uh, everywhere in the world. In fact, the pandemic has actually helped them expand their influence even more because they had to transition to being uh, virtual only, which meant that uh, their influence kind of grew and, and now you know They've got uh, chapters in places like New York, uh, Warsaw, um, uh, in South Africa as well, in Cape Town, I think. Um, not, uh, and then obviously we've still got the one in London. And this image here is is showing the uh, compare the market office back when we were all able to be in this kind of situation. Uh, and at this point in time, they're kind of doing their they're pairing up where effectively you have coaches that. Uh, give their free time to support uh, those who want to learn and it could be on any kind of language and this is where they pair the coaches up with the, the students effectively and uh, one of the most important reasons why I'm talking about COBAR is, is their focus on diversity and inclusivity so they uh, effectively their, their focus is on uh, non-white male engineers so they want to try and uh, support people that wouldn't traditionally be in in a technical role and um i think they've been really effective at that and and we've been supporting them uh as an organization and as a place to host these these code bars since 2018 and more recently when they became a, a not-for-profit organization officially we actually uh, became one of their sponsors a gold sponsor this year and um that means we, we've supported them financially and uh, we're also continuing to support them through various events. Uh, we've, we uh, completed a panel event recently and um, I'm really looking forward to when we can actually start hosting these events in the office again, because they were great fun. Uh, I, I did coach at some of them myself as well as just generally being a kind of busybody around the office, making sure everything was, was working okay. And then next up, we've got Code First Girls, uh, who like Code Bar, another not-for-profit profit organization. Um, and this photo was taken at the end of one of the cohorts that we ran. Um, and pre-pandemic, again, we had actually two cohorts. Uh, this was the second. Um, and actually, I, uh, I too did in this one as well, which was quite fun for me. Um, but uh, this was like a six to, to eight week program where uh, we'd host one uh, session a week in the office and our our engineers would actually tutor the students based on a syllabus driven by Code First Girls. And again, as you can see, um, Code First Girls, their focus is on, uh, on gender and, and uh, specifically uh, trying to get more uh, uh, non-male uh, gender people to, into uh, technology and from a starting point of working with things like HTML and JavaScript. And um, we haven't obviously had an opportunity again to work with uh, Code First Skills again with, with uh, the pandemic, but I am looking forward to uh, hosting another cohort at some point in the future when we can. And also the t-shirts you get for being a tutor are great as well. I've still got mine uh, wear it all the time. Uh, then uh, more recently, we have worked with an organization called Coding Black Females. And you may recognize myself and Esther there, uh, as well as Tula. We, we all were part of a panel uh, with Coding Black Females where we effectively had a focus on um, diversity in, in uh, technology and uh, quite a few questions were put to all of us and um, it was it was really fun. Uh, some of the questions were really interesting as well, I think, uh, and um, uh, it was quite an enjoyable thing to do. And again, with, with Coding Black Females, they focus is on bringing more black females into uh, into tech and into coding and uh, I'm also looking con to continue this relationship with coding black females and see how we can work with them again in the future um, 
uh, in other ways as well. So taking it away from other organizations uh, for a second uh, that we work with, I thought it'd be worthwhile just talking a little bit about what we do and compare the market from a recruitment perspective to uh, ensure that we're, we're keeping diversity and inclusivity in mind when we're recruiting our uh, new team members. So uh, one of the things that we, we uh, actually do is to use tools like uh, the uh, gender bias decoder to make sure that our job uh, adverts, our job specifications don't use uh, gender specific language uh, that maybe might appeal to more to a male uh, rather than uh, non-male. Uh, and also, we, we always make sure that as part of our interview process, anyone that's going to take part in interviews, we, we make sure we give them training so that they're aware of uh, effectively how to behave and, uh, you know, the best way to actually deal with uh, uh, situations where perhaps uh, you've got a, an individual that isn't a white male. And uh, further to that as well, uh, Although I, I definitely say that Compare the Market is one of the best places I've worked in terms of diversity, both from a gender perspective and uh, from an ethnicity perspective, uh, I still don't think we are, um, I think we could do more. But just to that respect, I, I, we, where we try to make the sure that we involve uh, a, as div diverse a panel as we can on uh, any interviews that for any individuals that uh, come into the business, um, rather than going with uh, a traditional all male panel. And then following on from that as well, just take some water, sorry. Uh, we also work with uh, specific recruitment partners as well. And some of you might have heard of uh, either Makers or Generation. Makers we've worked with for, for quite a long time now. And actually, previous to uh, 2019, we, we used to work with them uh, specifically from a perspective of they would train uh, individuals through their boot camp, and then we would recruit those individuals. Um, and uh, we had some really great engineers come through their program. Um, and they were really good at focusing on uh, trying to to build uh, boot camp cadres that were made up of not just uh, white males. And we continue to work with them now. And actually, we've kind of evolved our relationship and they are now part of our apprenticeship process. And Esther actually uh, is someone that's uh, a product of that. Um, and uh, to, to some extent, she's still going through that process, but she's actually part of a team in Compare the Market now. And uh, it's, it's really great to, ha to have uh, individuals like Esther come through programs like Makers. And then Generation are, are a similar organization. Uh, we've only just started working with them recently. And uh, this is because they had a more specific data engineering boot camp that we were quite interested in. And they really, really target um, uh, individuals that come from less privileged backgrounds, so perhaps poorer backgrounds. And uh, we're, we're as makers, if you're not coming through an apprenticeship scheme like um, uh, Compare the Market, for example, you generally have to pay a fee to, to uh, be part of their boot camp. With Generation, it's, it's more of a kind of um, scholarship scheme, scheme. So a lot more people apply that uh, potentially may not be able to go through a program like Makers. And so far, we've worked with them with one uh, group of individuals. And uh, we've been really lucky. And we've got two great engineers. Uh, and I'm going to call them out here in, in Vanessa and Nicole. Uh, and they've been with us now for uh, just over six months. And we're so happy that uh, we found them through Generation because they've been great additions to our team. And then another thing uh, on top of that within compare the market is is obviously promoting learning and education around diversity and inclusive inclusivity and 
what some of the ways they've, we've done this is more recently uh, we introduced unconscious bias training through our um, company training portal and uh, I've completed this training myself as well I've encouraged everyone on my team to complete it it's a really it was a really useful and eye-opening training for me um, and from that uh, I discovered the, the, there's a Harvard tool you can use to try and test your unconscious bias uh, I wonder if anyone here has actually done that and um, I only did one of the uh, um, one of the tests which I think was black versus white bias and uh, I w I'm quite ashamed to say that I scored one of the lowest scores you can get on on that. And uh, for myself, I, I've always thought of myself as uh, someone that doesn't have that unconscious bias. To, so to have that test tell me that uh, that wasn't the case uh, was quite an eye opener. And uh, from my, my own personal perspective, it's really it really kind of gave me a kick up the bum to kind of make sure I, I made a real conscious effort to to widen my horizons and, uh, you know, improve my learning, improve my education around these things, uh, which, as I, as I will come on to shortly, is why I'm, I'm part of uh, I'm a co-leader of a work stream around diversity and inclusivity in, to, in Compare the Market. And um, some other ways we've done this to uh, kind of more informally is around book clubs. Um, so uh, we have like a, a monthly book club and each month we pick a different theme. And each of those themes, since this has been running now, I think for perhaps maybe six, seven months or so, uh, have been diversity and inclusivity focused. So we had um, a book selected for Black History Month, which uh, was by Akala. Uh, which is called Natives, and I thought that book was amazing. Um, and uh, it basically taught me so much that I didn't know about kind of British history and, and Black British history. Uh, and um, uh, other things like, uh, for example, this month, because uh, it's Pride Month, for those of you who don't know, we've ac our actually book club focus month this month is going to be a book that's kind of pride themed and that will be driven by by someone from the lgbtq uh, plus community as well um, other than that uh, there have been various uh, we we've effectively tried to get uh, th uh, thought leaders and experts in the diversity and inclusivity community to come in and talk to to the organization as a whole um, and I think uh, compare the market has really stepped up its game uh, in the past year on this front uh, in terms of putting a focus on these things and actually making it front and center um, uh, and and I think there's I think there's room for improvement there always is but they've definitely uh, made uh, much of a step change since uh, I'd say probably the start of last year. So that brings me on uh, neatly to, to what our current initiative is in Compare Market, which is uh, something called Inclusive by Instinct. And as you can see there, we've got uh, four different uh, work streams that we're focusing on at this point in time. And our vision is to, to effectively communicate and be proud of our inclusivity, measure our change, uh, and, and obviously uh, look to improve uh, based on that change. And uh, with each of these different work streams, um, we're, we're looking to basically celebrate uh, local, national, international diversity events. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the Black History Month event was something that we, we kind of had many different things happening through that month. Um, we're using all of our kind of communication channels to use each of the leaders in these streams to promote uh, different things um, month to month and one of the key things to mention is that every person in each of these streams uh, ha is a volunteer from the organization but we've also got the buy-in from our exec community which I think is really important to have uh, to, to drive these diversity uh, and inclusivity uh, initiatives and that is our uh, chief data officer uh, in, in Susie Moan and um, I think we've we're kind of in, a start, in the start of our journey with this new uh, Inclusive by Instinct um, uh, initiative, but I do uh, have a lot of uh, excitement and faith uh, for, for this moving forward and seeing how we can focus on each of these things in turn. 
um, because obviously trying to do everything at once is, is a real challenge. Um, and I've kind of touched on this a little bit already, um, but for myself, I think uh, it's very much important to continuously drive your own improvement in, in these areas. And, and uh, as Esther said, you know, to talk to people that are, are different to me and, and get their viewpoint and get their recommendations on, on cultural things to educate yourself on. And, um, uh, you know, I will continue to do that as, as, uh, as we move forward um, into 2021. And I'll do that through uh, my co-leadership of the, the gender work stream in, in the diversity and inclusivity initiative, um, as well as just individually taking part in other initiatives in, in Compare the Market. So uh, that is uh, both Esther and I's uh, talks. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed them. Um, and uh, yeah, here you've got all of the Compare the Market uh, socials uh, if you would like to get in touch with us or follow us or anything like that. Um, so yeah, thank you. Ian, thank you so much. Thanks so much for that. It's really insightful, some really great points. Um, I just wanted to, um, so yeah, just to let you know that this is recorded, so um, you'll have access to the video and kind of can go back on some, um, go back and have a look at some of the kind of points and groups that were made. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to welcome anyone who might have some questions, you can either put them in the chat. Um, we've had a few comments already um, asking for the slides. Thank you so much. Um, saying thank you to you. It's excellent. Um, but yeah, just any questions that anyone got? I've worn just interested on the book group what the take up was like for that. Sorry, I need I couldn't find the unmute because I was sharing my screen. I should probably stop sharing now. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a good question. I think um, the take up of the actual book club itself wasn't too bad. We had around, I think, maybe 20, 25 people. And then the actual discussion in the book club uh, tended to be fewer people. Um, and it really depends on the on the topic as well. So uh, when we when we did the Akala book for uh, Black History Month, I think we had about um, 15, 16 people on on the uh, the book club chat, mm -hmm. which was really great. Um, the book club that I headed up recently, which was uh, focused on um, cultural diversity month was uh, an abridged version of uh, black and British, which I think was a children focused book, which is a lot shorter than the, the actual book, um, which I didn't realize at the time when I picked it, uh, but it actually turned out to be um, quite useful for a lot of people because obviously finding the time to read a book and, and what have you. And it's really encouraged me to actually read the, the full length book because of the, the themes and uh, the really interesting things covered in that. Uh, that one, we didn't have so many people um, join it, but it's, I think it's one of those things, I guess, with, with especially everyone being at home and everyone kind of being sick of uh, being on video calls. It's really difficult to try and encourage people to spend some time outside of work to jump on a call and discuss something like that. Um, mm. what, what was your kind of... Uh, thinking behind the question uh, have you had any success with a book club yourself no it's, it's not something that uh, that we've tried but i liked the idea and yeah we was just kind of curious as to how it had gone down uh when you said like a, a book a month i know for myself that that'd be a challenge yeah um you know fitting that in around everything but yeah i i know I, I think it's a great idea and actually you mentioned kind of you know in these times not maybe not wanting to jump on another video call However, I guess the flip side is that you, you people are looking for something to do outside of the video calls and reading a book has been a really popular thing. So to kind of give people a bit of guidance with that and, and have it be a shared activity is um, yeah, it's a really nice idea. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, definitely encourage you to, to give it a go. And I think the hardest part is getting people to volunteer to run those 
book sure. club sessions and actually to come up with the book selection and the theme and, and stuff like that. But once you get a good group of people that are looking to drive it, um, uh, I think it, you're away. Yeah. I Great. personally am a big fan of book clubs as well, to be honest. Like I've been part of a, one in the diversity community and um, they are a bit of a commitment, but you can come in and out of, you know, of them as and when you wish. So there's a lot of flexibility around it, but it's great for education and sharing knowledge and ideas. And so like, I'm a big fan of them as well. Um, personally, I've taken a lot from it as too. So I think we've got, um, Kay's got a hand up, wants to ask a question. Oh, hi, hello, if I may, please. Hello. I've got two small questions actually. Um, if I may. The first one is, I'm actually a Sikh, okay, and it's one of the newer religions, and what I tend to find is that wherever I go, wherever I work, it is one of the religions that tends to be forgotten, forgotten about, you know. They might talk about um, Islam because it's quite a, a lot of people do, uh, are, are Muslim, and we talk about black people, we might talk about, but, but when it comes to Sikhism, is there anything there, anything about Indians in terms of that that you do? Or have you done anything in terms of diversity and inclusion? Yeah, I think it's a really good point um, that if as an organization you don't have representation of a particular thing, uh, like mm. Sikhism or whatever it is, I think mm. it, it does become uh, more challenging to, to drive a conversation around that and to drive recognition of that. But um, specifically to your point around, um, have we done anything specifically around uh, Indian religion? So we did do a, a focus on Diwali recently, um, mm. and um, we've we've got representatives in the uh, diversity and inclusivity, uh, inclusive by instinct work stream that are focusing on those kind of things. So it's definitely not something that I think compare the market would shy away from um mm. but mm. what i would what i wouldn't want to do is i wouldn't want someone that effectively isn't uh someone who follows sikhism to be driving that conversation right i think you need to have someone that actually um has had that experience and is able to mm. talk about it in in a in a manner that makes sense mm. and I, i'm a british born sikh and it, it's quite upsetting for me actually we've just had the indian new year and no one even knows, but we get the Chinese New Year, such and such New Year, we'll get, um, obviously Christianity would, obviously we live in England and so on, but no one ever knows there's an Indian New Year, you know, and we are always forgotten about, we really are, I, I have, you know, I'm, I'm in my 50s now, and, and, um, and, and really, it is, I mean, Sikhism just isn't mentioned in any organisation that I've ever been, been to really. And uh, so something I'd like to kind of leave feedback for you, if you don't do that, you know, what, how much staff have you got that seeks and, and what is actually being done in terms of diversity inclusion, in terms of Indian people, in terms of there's different kinds of Indians out there as well. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's, that's a factor that, that, that matters to me because I'm seeing it, it's underrepresented in terms of our Sikh faith. That's what I think. And, and the other thing is I'd like to mention, if I may, please, is age. Like I'm saying in my 50s, you know, in terms of diversity, we talk about um, race, we talk about gender, we talk about religion, okay? But at the end of the day, in terms of diversity, um, age should be in there. You might talk about apprenticeships and scholarships. We're talking a lot about younger staff coming in and everything. But what about people like me that have got years and years of experience? We're highly qualified, years and years of experience, and yet we get discriminated because of our age. But diversity should include that too. Is there anything you can tell me about age in terms of compare the market? You know, somebody that might be in my age group, that's something you might do. There might be feedback for you there again, maybe even, because I, I feel we get discriminated. Um, and, and we have a lot to offer. We have life experiences in terms of life skills and not just education or qualifications or um, the different jobs that we've done, sort of work experience. But we have massive life experience to offer. I mean, I do a lot of mentoring and coaching within my job. I'm not actually a coach or anything, but I, I end up doing that even on a personal level. I have lots of people that come to me and I do lots, lots of coaching. Um, and can you comment on that for me at all in terms of age <sighs> older age mature age i'm talking about 
Esther, I think you were just about to say something, weren't you? Um, yeah, I was going to comment from, obviously I haven't been here for very long, but from just my experience, um, um, I came through Makers, so I know Makers is for everyone. It's like no matter the age, no matter the experience. Um, there was someone that actually had already worked at Compare the Market for many, many years that wanted a new role and wanted to go through Makers. And he was on my cohort with me. We're really good friends. His name is Ben. And yeah, he has his children, everything. And um, another guy called Gareth, but we all were treated in the same way. And we all like joined at the same time, have the same training. So I can only comment on that, what I've seen, but maybe Dawi has a bit more to add to that. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think hey, you, you raise a really good point around um, uh, ageism and, and age being a part of that diversity uh, mm. conversation. Uh, I, yes. I certainly don't think there's anything specific that I can say that compare the market have done recently, but it's mm. something I will definitely take back with me after mm. after what you've said here today to mm. to make it part of the conversation. It's not just compare the market, it's everywhere. The two factors, things I've mentioned about today regarding our religion, Sikhs get discriminated and we get left out. We get forgotten about, should I say. And then when it comes to age, that we actually have so much to offer and instead we get discrimination yeah you know, just you're 50, I, can, I can I can like yeah I can understand you know where you're coming from and I think that that's why these conversations like what we're having mm. now need to happen yeah. so that we can have these discussions raise awareness educate and then mm. people can go into their organizations and you know make these points people can step up and I think I think Doey made a really important point. You have to have representation in the organisations. You have to have Sikhs. You have to have the older generations. People stand up and have that voice and raise those points. Otherwise, it's not going to get noticed and it, it, it needs those people to almost champion it. So that's my point on it is that, you know, stand up, have keep having these conversations, speak out at your current company that you work at. And, you know, if then not in a horrible way, but if they don't listen, then maybe they're not the right company for you. And that's where organizations that are diverse and inclusive will listen to these points and, mm -hmm. and do something about it. So, you know, that's why these conversations need to keep happening um, more and more because I wanted to have further training. I mean, I actually work as a, a part-time lecturer in a, in a college, actually. Um, I, I To get promotion, I had to do my own training and pay for it myself. They weren't prepared to promote me, although I had actually got nearly 30 years experience of working on education. I actually mm -hmm. got told if you were younger, you know, they would they have paid for saying, me. You know, that shouldn't, those shouldn't be things that, that you're hearing, that, to be honest. Yeah. Like, yeah, that was clear discrimination. That's the kind of things I get. And, and actually, yet, there is the there is the Equality Act that kind of includes, you know, these characteristics like age that a, a protect. You know, they should they that should protect you. So those things yeah. shouldn't be happening in in organisations. So you know that that's something that you can raise if that's coming up. You know, yeah. um, and I've got thirty years experience of working yeah. in education. I've had to train myself up to be a lecturer on my own time on my own money yeah. and then I, they gave me the job but mm. but it's like you know I, and, and I feel I think because I'm over 50 that's probably why because mm. people tend to judge you once you get over 50 but actually we've got a lot of life skills to offer if anything you know yeah we can no. be really good mentors in the workplace yeah and I do a lot of that outside my job I do mentoring on a personal level lots of friends acquaintances family approach me and I do lots of coaching and mentoring with people. Yeah. And I've got, but I'm not qualified, but I've, I've done plenty. I've got people that, that can tell you how, where they were and where they got to, you know. Yeah. But I think something we need to look at a lot of companies, well, most companies, let's look at age and just take it as, as a positive thing, not as a negative thing. And also, don't forget about spouse of Sikhs. If you see somebody walk around with a steel bangle around their arm, say hello to them because they're a Sikh. You know, that's how you sort of, uh, with the women anyway, you'll be able to tell they're Sikhs when they wear the steel bangle. But the guys, you can tell with the turbans. Yeah. With that. Anyway, no, it's a bit of a sensitive topic, these two things. I'm sorry I had to yeah. raise them, but it touches my heart because I experience this all the time. Yeah, well, keep speaking up in, you know, where you work. And, you know, we all keep doing, you know, raising awareness and doing as much as we can to kind of create these conversations. So, uh -huh. Um, I've got a question actually. I don't know if anyone else has got questions, but I've got a, qu a quick one. Do you measure diversity at Compare the Market? 
um it's just a, it's just i don't know if any you know how organizations measure it um in terms of kind of stats is that something that you you do at all or or not um well as a whole i'm not sure of the stats but within my team we do um we know we have like we have we keep a track of the different nationalities we have um in the team because every week um someone presents does a presentation in our team break um based on where they're from so the whole team comes together and you know we sit there for half an hour and um literally just watch a presentation about where they're from and their background and experiences and then we have a quiz after so we know we have right now about i think maybe touching 16 national nationalities within the mobile team which i think is quite impressive um it's not a huge team so yeah that's what i can say for my team specifically brilliant yeah from a from a wider perspective from from the organization we did uh in the last six months send out an organizational wide uh, survey where we we asked these kind of questions around diversity um and obviously people were uh, not obligated to fill it in because i think that's the the tricky thing you don't want to if you're talking about for example um uh if an individual is part of the lgbtq plus community you know you don't want to feel people to feel forced into having to to quantify that if they don't want to the same with uh, gender identification so um but i think it's important to, to try and measure that thing because you need a way to uh measure the success of your initiatives right so how are we going to know um when we when we kind of pr proceed forward with this uh, inclusive by instinct uh, work group in compare the market. How do we know if it's successful? I mean, Esther gave a great example of how you, you can measure that at team level, but at an organizational level, it becomes a lot more challenging. But I think it's a really important thing to to do and address, um, and to be, to really kind of um, be upfront about it uh, in terms of recognizing that it's a necessary thing to address. Okay. No, that's great. Good. Good to know. Um, any other questions? I think we might be. Uh, uh, hi, guys. Oh, hello. <laughs> hey, how are you? Uh, by the way, very nice talk by Esther, actually. By, by Esther and uh, both, both of them, actually, I compare the market. Uh, I wanted to ask you something. So we were talking about, obviously, you guys were talking about uh the diversity right okay either your race racial diversity or any other diversity right uh can i ask esther in in the actual employment market as such has she seen has she seen any sort of uh disparity in terms of uh i mean neurodiversity so for example diversity in disability Um, I think because I started remotely, um, sometimes disability can be obvious or can not be obvious, or I'm not too sure, but everything is on Zoom, so I can't really answer that. But in terms of for face value, I haven't really seen much disparity within my team specifically. Um, but then again, I, I can't just say that because um, I don't see it. It's, it's not there. I'm not too sure, though. Oh, I see. I see. I thought I'd just bring it up. <laughs> I can I can just uh, to add to, to what Esther just said there. Um, we did uh, as part of a global uh, disability uh, awareness day. We actually had a, a neurodiversity um, uh, kind of meetup uh, in in the organisation. We had representatives from the organisation who were prepared to actually share their stories. Um, and uh, their, their own personal kind of experience with uh, neurodivergence. And it actually went down really well. And I think it's, uh, you know, coming back to Kay as well, uh, and yourself, I think it's really hard to actually put yourself out there and, and to kind of talk about these things. Um, but uh, like to a, to a T, I think any, everyone and anyone who attended this um, in the organization, uh, they all said it was it was a really great way to to kind of have a talk talk about this and to actually recognize that it's a thing that as Esther said isn't always easily recognizable right um do you do you do anything with um 
like people from disadvantaged like backgrounds or um even like um like people that have come out of prison or any any groups like kind of that kind of groups like that but more related to technology um to kind of move them into tech or get them into tech or encourage that is it just compare the market do anything with those types of those groups uh to my knowledge i can't i can't 100 percent say yes or no i i do seem to remember that in the past i think we we worked with uh, a recruitment agency that focused on uh, placing people that had been in the military um, and that perhaps uh, from that perspective had found it more difficult to to kind of break into the tech industry. Um, specific, specifically to around kind of engagement with those who have been in prison, I, I don't know, I can't answer that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's something that I, I definitely would hope we would be open to because I think it's a it, it's, it's again it's another facet of, uh, of of basically being inclusive right um and you know that's why I when I talked about working with an organization like generation mm -hmm. who are you know thinking back to when I uh, was uh aspiring to be an engineer a uh, long 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 time ago um I had you know the only entryway to becoming an engineer was to get a degree to get a computer science degree and now you've got all of these other opportunities with these boot camps to uh, and especially boot camps like generation to allow people that might actually think i really want to do that thing but it just doesn't seem attainable mm -hmm. and i think it's important to support those kind of organizations and uh like i said already you know we're so happy with the two engineers that we we've we've uh, placed in our teams through generation yeah I was asking because I've had a few, we've had a couple of clients that have asked us if we can, rep, because obviously we're, we predominantly do tech recruitment, but if we cut up, if we represent um, people from those, you know, from those kind of backgrounds and we, it's something that I've not got experience with kind of, kind of finding. So it, it'd be, I'd, you know, I'd be interested in finding some avenues into how to kind of connect with them, but also how, how I'd actually transition them into tech into the tech industry as because obviously there's a certain skill set that's needed so it you know i was just sit wondering if there was anything that you knew around that um but if you do then let me know <laughs> um but other than that i think i'm i'm good with questions um has anyone else got any we've got a few minutes left but um so yeah if, has anyone else got any other questions or i think I think we may be wrapping up so um yeah it's uh five to six anyway so it's coming to the end of the time but um thank you so much for sharing that insight that presentation um with us today i thought it was really there was some really great things that i haven't even um heard about you know and i've been around kind of learning about diversity and other initiatives for, for a long for a while so there was definitely stuff that i took out of it and from the comments and the chat um, people have said that it's, it was really, really great. Um, so like I said, it's recorded. So I'll definitely send out the link to everyone tomorrow um, and it will go onto our Oliver Bernard YouTube page. Um, but yeah, get in touch with um, Compare the Market if you've got any further questions or feel free to contact me directly. But um, thank you so much again. And I hope you everyone has a really nice evening and enjoys the rest of the, 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 the kind of daylight that we've got. So... <laughs> Thanks, Noshin. Well, Thanks, no everyone. Nice Take to meet care. you all. Thanks. Take Thanks care. again. Bye. 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 Take care.